Um, I hope you all don't mind if I make a couple announcements, uh, kind of pastoral announcements before I jump into the sermon itself. Um, to be 100% honest with you, you have no choice, so <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen whether you like it or not. But uh, three things I want to say, uh, two I was planning on and one just came this morning. So the first thing is, uh, Richard, I asked Chris if I could share the update about Richard Antone. Um, I know there's a lot of new faces in here, and I say the name Richard Antone, and that means nothing to you. Um, but let me just say this. Uh, Richard and his wife, Carrie, uh, came, moved from Altoona area to uh, this area 40-some years ago and planted, uh, the two of them planted this church that you're participating in now. And so uh, for a bunch of us, that means a whole lot because uh, nothing good and godly that comes from this church ministry would be happening if it wasn't for, for Richard. And so... Um, Richard and Carrie. And so the update on his health, if you got the email from last night, is that yesterday afternoon, Richard had uh, kind of fallen in his, his place at Valley View, uh, had a brain bleed. They took him to Lewistown Hospital. He was life flighted to Danville, uh, basically with a, a, a stroke. Uh, Richard was there, his daughter Tina, who has been bringing him recently from Valley View to have services with us. Uh, she uh, was there. He was getting another scan at 7 p.m. last night. The doctor called Tina on her way back home from Danville and said that uh, it wasn't, not only was it not any better or stopped, it had actually gotten worse. And so the expectation is that, uh, I mean, literally as we speak or sometime today or tomorrow, uh, Richard is, is going to pass away. And so he was, uh, or is 90, 93 years old. Uh, lived a beautiful life with a beautiful, beautiful legacy, and is not worried about his eternal future. Um, but his prayer request to me quite often has been, I just want to pray for my unsaved family members, um, that they would come to know the Lord. And so if you could uh, pray for the Antone kind of family uh, through this time, uh, it's, it's going to hit pretty hard. And so, and pray for me. Um, I know I just, keep, I just keep getting funerals to do. It's really sad. And um, it's, it's important and meaningful and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, just, just please pray about that. <clears throat> um, the second kind of update I want to give uh, announcement-wise is about uh, Good Friday and Easter. And so a lot of this stuff I know we send out on the Kish Updates uh, uh, Tuesday emails, which if you don't get, let me know and you can get them. Uh, but I also want to say uh, publicly that I used to not be a pastor, and I also got those emails. And so I'm well aware that everyone is not like the few people who read them each week with a fine-tooth comb, that everybody is not in that same position. And so uh, I'm thankful for those folks, and some people here don't get the emails. So I just want to say a couple things about Good Friday and Easter. Uh, so Good Friday last year I thought was one of our most meaningful services uh, that we had. And we're going to basically do that again, but we've expanded it a bit to include more parts of communion. And so uh, not this Friday, but next Friday, we are going to have a, a meal. It's going to be catered. And, and part of the reason for that is uh, we want you to not worry about what am I going to make to bring to the church meal kind of a deal. Uh, we're just going to pay for that food to be here and encourage you to come and share a meal with your church family together. Um, after the meal, uh, we're going to do foot washing which I'm 100% aware is really awkward for Americans in 2022. Um, I'll tell you this, it's also particularly awkward when the person across the seat from you is Keith Cram and his toenails are painted pink. <laughs> so, 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 so we've been there. The, the, the point is, <laughs> thank you. I actually, as I said it, I thought, I think I got that wrong. Uh, Keith can tell you the story later. The point is, it was also unbelievably awkward for the king of the universe to come here to earth and wash his sinful disciples' dirty, filthy feet. And so I'll just leave that at that. Um, at 7 o'clock, we're going to have the service here on Friday night. Uh, it'll be dark, and it'll be gloomy, and it'll be sad. And the point of that is not to <laughs> purposely be miserable. There's plenty of things, plenty of opportunities for that everywhere you turn these days, it seems like. The purpose of it is this. I think you don't get the full joy and hope of Easter if you skip over 
the sadness and pain of Good Friday. And so we're, we want to do both things here. And so that Good Friday service will have um, communion within the service. And uh, hopefully it's just a real important time for us to be here and to, to in all of its beauty and glory and sadness, uh, kind of reflect on Jesus' death for us. Uh, Easter will be uh, here this year. Uh, I realize like Sunday after Sunday, there's more people here. And I think, how in the world are we going to do this on Easter? But uh, we've decided uh, to not have it at the elementary school this year. We might go back to that in the, in the long term. Um, we're going to make some space downstairs for overflow, and I'm, I hope we're going to need it. Uh, that's, that's basically my deal. And so uh, Pastor Chris put together these things. Uh, they should be in your bulletin. There's more out here on the, the lobby table. Uh, advertisements for both Good Friday and on the back is Easter. Um, I read a stat that was real interesting that 86% of people, even some of the people that I'm looking at now that I don't even really know you, 86% of people that come to church services for, for any reason generally come so uh, come because somebody else invited them, usually a friend or a family member. And so my favor to you is use these, talk to people, get them here so we can share the hope of Jesus. Um, the second big category I want to give, or the third big category I want to give announcements about is relationships. Um, it's my strong, strong belief that church is not a come on Sunday and sit and listen to this awesome music and me, you know, ramble on and tell a few half-decent jokes. The point of church is that it's a fellowship of people that go through life together in relationship to Jesus. And so I want to ask you, as like new people come and older people are around, I want to ask you to really push into the relationship things as best you can. And so sometimes I think for people that looks formal. It's like, I'm going to join this small group, of which there are some. Uh, I'm going to join the Sunday school class. I'm going to do that kind of stuff. Uh, sometimes it's kind of, in my head, semi-formal, right? So you join the worship team or uh, the money counters, which I think is beautiful, uh, tend to go out to lunch uh, together pretty often, not on the church's dime. Um, you'll get that on the way home. Uh, the... Or it could be completely informal, right? So it's just people getting together at people's houses, going out to lunch together, all this kind of stuff, right? Like we're not going to necessarily manage all of that, but my hope is that everybody here cannot know every single person, but everybody here should be known and should know somebody. And so please push into the relationships. And along with that goes the fact that Easter is coming, and generally speaking, around Easter, a whole bunch of the, the Christmas and Easter folks show up to church, and it's not my sermon or my speaking that's always going to kind of speak the truth of the gospel into their lives, in some real ways, it's quite often the people here who reach out, who get to know their name, who ask their life story, who talk to them before or afterward, or that kind of stuff that really changes their life. And so um, basically what I'm trying to say is let's share that mission together. Uh, it's not all on my shoulders, nor can it be. Uh, please, I'm, I'm inviting you to relationally connect with more people around here at Kish. All right, I'm done with announcements. <clears throat> Thank you for listening, whether you chose to or not. Um, now, you'll, you'll think this is funny, probably. What I want to talk about today is Jesus and money and stuff. And so already, uh, you might have recognized that I used that really long announcement time to de decrease the amount of time that you had to get angry at me <laughs> for what I'm going to say <laughs> about Jesus and money and stuff. Um, I'll also add, though, that I particularly put this sermon uh, in here right before tax day. So if, if you're going to be upset with me, at least here's your pastorly reminder uh, that tax day is coming up. Make sure you get all your taxes, even the local ones, done uh, and in on time. Um, at, a, at a much deeper level, we're going through this sermon series here called Apprentices of Jesus, and we're asking the question of whether or not Jesus is worth being our master of every part of our lives. And so what I'm hoping to do today is to encourage us to not just open up the parts of our lives that we're comfortable with, but to open up <clears throat> our books and our closets and our attics <clears throat> and our spaces all to the, the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, because we think that's the best way to live as a human in this world. So let me start with a couple of stats I don't know that any of these people are here, but I do know that 80% of Americans have some amount of consumer debt. 
So four out of five people owe money for something they got um, that they didn't have the money to pay for up front. Money issues are the second leading cause of divorce behind infidelity. I thought this was so fascinating. 3.1% of the kids in the world live in America, and we have 40% of the world's toys. And as a parent of three kids, like, I can speak to that. It's just like, they just show up, you know? It's just like, there's an army of toys outside of our house invading, and it's like, how do they all get here, you know? Uh, Over the course of a lifetime, we'll spend 153 days looking for misplaced items. Now, I think that number's a little skewed, because my guess is that that's, like, very high for the moms, um, because all the dads and the kids, like, give up looking after, like, an hour, you know, and they're still out there, like, hey, wife or mom, do you know where my other shoe is, or whatever. So, God bless those moms. Um, I could go on. There's, like, a, a, a <laughs> there's so many stats related to the issues and problems connected to this thing called money in the world that I could, I could spend this whole time talking about all of them. And I'm guessing that y'all are aware that those problems are a reality for, for a lot of people. Um, and I'm, I'm also guessing that some people here are like, man, I, I picked the wrong Sunday to show, to show up at church. So I'm not unaware that my task today is to try to talk about money in a way that is actually helpful for your real life, that is gracious, that also gets to the truth of what the Bible talks about, and um, maybe helps those of you who right now are sitting there thinking, this is an awesome sermon for somebody else, but I certainly don't need to hear it. So God, God please help me. Um, all right. So I'm a big fan. Uh, if you heard us around here, we're a big fan of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm guessing you've heard of him. Um, and I think I'm becoming more and more convinced over time that what Jesus has to say about everything in this world is really worth following. Like he really knows not just, you know, that he died on the cross and that gets me to heaven, but like his whole view of everything is way better than anything we could come up with on our own. And so I think I think what Jesus would say about money and stuff is that it is a very, very spiritual act. In other words, it's not like, oh, over here, I pray and I read the Bible and I go to church and that's like the spiritual piece of me. And then over here is like how I spend money. Or as I said this in the sermon I did before about money, uh, 10% of my money goes to God and thank you very much, I'll keep 90% to do what I want. I don't think Jesus has that view at all. And I think we can tell that because if we read what he says in Matthew chapter 6, here's what it says. So this is in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A few sentences down, he says this, uh, No one can serve two masters because either he's going to hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other because you cannot serve God and money. These are Jesus' words, not, not mine. I'm just the messenger. You cannot serve God and money. And I'm guessing if you're anything like me, you might be sitting there right now saying, that's exactly right, Pastor Luke. Um, I hope somebody hears this sermon today because thankfully I serve God and I don't serve money. And if that thought is going through your brain, then I want to kind of, hopefully this sermon is is helpful at some level for you. What I want to do today is, maybe to your surprise, at some level, I don't want to, I know I've already done it somewhat already, but I don't want to badmouth or kind of guilt trip people in, in a negative way about money and finances and that kind of stuff. I mean, <laughs> there's the reality that we're living in America, which is the richest country, it's the richest time, and, and so that's just the reality of, of, of our situation, Right? What I want to do today is something a little different than that. I want to try to open up for you 
maybe a new or different or possibly even exciting way to look at Jesus' life when it came to his views on money, his views on stuff, his teachings about them, and also the life he lived. And what I want to do is I want to try to make that like stand out to you as like, that's really, really desirable. Like, I don't want to go on and on about the negative stuff. I want to say, look at Jesus, the way he viewed and thought and lived out his relationship with money and stuff is something that could be really, really exciting and cool and fun and good for everybody. And so that's what we're going to try to do. And so if you think about Jesus and living his life, I just want to ask some questions. So Paul, Paul talks about how Jesus, uh, gave, basically, he, he was rich and kind of gave up his riches to become poor down here on, on, on his time on earth. And so I think that it's fascinating to me, right? Jesus had the most impact of any human being in the history of the, of the earth. Every, every, even if people that aren't Christians, they would all agree to that point. And like, how fascinating is it that he didn't just do that in three years, that's pretty awesome, <laughs> but he did it in three years as somebody with no physical, no material wealth or relatively little material wealth. It's like so interesting to me, right? Like nowadays, if you want to go into politics, if you want to be a, a mover and shaker, you need to have the funding to, right? This was not Jesus's life. And so like, what was it about his life and his relationship with the money that was so fascinating? Um, <clears throat> for one thing, <laughs> I do not have the time today to go into every detail of Jesus and his money. There's all sorts of stories, and you may or may not have heard a pastor say before that Jesus spoke more about money than he did about both heaven and hell. But to me, that's, like, that's a real fascinating thing. Like, he obviously cared a lot about that, so don't shoot the messenger. This is Je- I'm just trying to show off Jesus and what he was like and what he talked about. And so one of the things I'd like to offer you today is this. I have a list. Uh, they're in the sermon notes page for those of you that are sermon notes people, um, or you can get one on the way out or whatever, uh, a list of those five passages you see up there. And what they are are there five different teachings that Jesus gave about humans' relationships with money. And I'd invite you to do this. I'd invite you to read through those passages and just ask yourself, is there something in here that could help me? Right? Is there something, do I, do I really trust what Jesus said about money to be actually true in the real world? Or would I rather have this situation where I say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and saving me from my sins, but I'll take care of my money over here because I don't know that I can trust you with it. That's kind of the, 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 the question for today. Um, about Jesus' life, I want to share one, one point and one point only. I feel like my pastor game is going down. I usually have three points, but today it's only one. Uh, But my wife pointed out to me, this is fascinating, that my one point is focus, uh, which actually works well because it's one thing and and the word is focus. And so what I want you to do is I want you to think about Jesus' life and I want you to think about how he was able to focus on what he wanted to do because of the freedom that he had, let's say, materially or financially. I'm guessing most of you have heard uh, about this idea. It's a cultural idea of minimalism, right? Nod your head. If you've, heard, you've heard of this thing called minimalism. So you can watch the Netflix shows about it or like there's those YouTube people uh, and they take this to the far extreme, right? Because they're like sitting on the floor in their apartment with nothing but like a computer and themselves. And it's like, I'm better than you because I don't have a chair or something like that. Like take that idea. If that's your vision of minimalism, t- throw that out the window. I'm not talking about that. Here's what I'm talking about. The cultural idea of minimalism is something like this. I'm going to narrow down my stuff. I'm going to narrow down my stuff so that I'm not distracted and I'm not too busy to focus on what I really want to focus on. I'm going to narrow down my stuff so I'm not too distracted or too busy to focus on what I really want to focus on. And I think if you have that vision of minimalism, where basically the, the idea is simply this. Whatever you value inside, that's what you live out externally, right? So you don't have the things that are going get to get, get in the way of, of the freedom to do that. And when you think about it that way, I would argue that Jesus provides like the prime example of someone who lived a beautiful minimalist lifestyle. Envision him, right? Um, 
during his first 30 years before he started his ministry, we know Jesus worked, uh, and there's some indication that he had a house um, and lived a life sort of more similar to what you and I might live. And then he kind of gathered his band of 12 disciples, and they went, they took this thing on the road. And they spent three years kind of traipsing all about uh, Judea, and during that time, they were more or less free from a lot of the encumbrances that we might experience in our life, right? They got nothing but their clothes on their back, and Jesus is walking around. And so what, what did that do for his life? This is kind of my question for today. How did that make his life in some ways healthy? Certainly, did he have the time, right? Did he have the free time to give to people, to love and care for people as he went along his way, kind of seeing and, and, and meeting them and focusing on, on who they were? I think absolutely. He even, so in, uh, I think it's Luke chapter 8, there's this passage where Jesus even needed other people to help him. Like, they paid for, for his way out of their resources. And to me, it's fascinating. Like, here's this guy, the king of the universe. He comes down, he has nothing, and there's other people helping him financially and physically uh, in his way. And I think that benefited his, his relationships. Uh, the passage goes, and you, you may have heard of this, uh, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And I completely get, I can, I can see it on your faces, to be 100% honest, that in America in 2022, we're like, there ain't no way I'm sleeping with a rock as my pillow. You know, like this sounds crazy talk, and is Pastor Luke up there telling me I need to sell all my stuff and live in poverty in order to be a follower of Jesus? I'm just going to let that question hang for a second, Okay. So let that question hang for a second. Um, you might think that Jesus was relatively poor. And I think there's a lot of Christians who say something like, in order to be like Jesus, what we need to do is be externally at the same level as him. So we need to get rid of all of our stuff. You know, there's, there's been... Throughout the course of Christianity, the history of Christianity, there's been a lot of people who have said something like, sell all my stuff and become poor like Jesus for the sake of Jesus. And that's a question that we really have to wrestle with. It's a question that we really have to wrestle with. There's another side of people who, and I get this, we say something like, well, Jesus cares more about what's happening on the inside, and as long as my heart's good, it doesn't matter if I have, you know, some material stuff and we have some things and if I'm using it for God's glory and this kind of thing. <laughs> and then I go back to the data that says 80% of Americans are in consumer debt and we're giving up our lives and all this kind of stuff. And so I hope you're at some place where you can see the tension between these two positions related to how we deal with money as Christians. Right? I, I hope you're someplace able to see this, this tension. And so I think minimalism is catching on culturally, even outside of the Christian realm, precisely because some people are saying, man, I'm just so busy, and I, I, I'm not able to live the life I want to live because I have so much stuff, and kind of the American dream has, has me in this, this pathway, this river that I can't escape out of. And so I, I think that question, you know, is, is worthwhile. And so in this sermon series, what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to show off the beauty and the wisdom of Jesus. And I've been trying to say that if we want to be an apprentice of Jesus, we want to take all the stuff that he lived and said and did seriously because uh, that's what an apprentice does for their master. And so we need to ask these kinds of questions. Now, here's where the problem really comes in, though. This is the part of the sermon I'm most excited to say. No one in this room lives out Jesus' vision for money perfectly. In other words, if Jesus' vision for money, as he said himself in the Sermon on the Mount, is that you cannot serve God and money, every single person in some ways in our lives ends up serving money instead of serving God. That's the human condition. We all serve money in some ways instead of serving God. And so in some cases... What that looks like is uh, I was raised as basically the child of Dave Ramsey, and that means that never in my life am I going to touch debt. 
I'm going to gain as much wealth as I possibly can, and I'm going to give as generously as I possibly can give that money to other people. And we see that person, and we think, that's really good, but it's hard to tell in our heart motives whether that wealth earning and generous giving is tied to love for God or it's tied to the fact that I'm super secure and nothing's going to get to me because I have a lot of money. And on the other hand, there's people, probably people sitting here saying something like, you know, I'm $50,000 in consumer debt. I can't stick my head above water. I don't know what to do. Clearly, I don't love things more than money because I don't have any money, right? And so I, I'm, I'm in, you know, some level or some version of poverty. And that person can say, I'm living kind of the way that Jesus wanted us to live because I don't have a lot of wealth. And yet, that can be unhealthy in its, own, in its own way. And so the fundamental issue is precisely what Jesus said. It's all about what's happening in your heart. And this is why through this whole sermon series, I've been so focused on getting away from the externals. Because to be 100% honest with you, if you have a ton of money or if you have no money, all of us have unhealth in our heart when it comes to spending money. We'd rather serve ourselves than serve God. All right, this is where it gets real cool. So as we're about to talk about in a, in a, in a couple weeks, uh, there's this incident where Jesus is about to go to the cross. And when that's about to happen, uh, Judas, which is one of his 12 people, the guy who he entrusted with the church, the, the group Purse Strings, who's been using it poorly, Judas goes to the religious elites and says, what will you do for me if I turn him over to you? And they say, we'll give you 30 pieces of silver. And in essence, what's happening in that, that, relate, that, that dynamic is that there's a decision to be made by Judas. Am I going to choose to serve God Right? Like, am I, I going to choose to serve God by refusing the money and keeping the, the human son of God alive on this earth? Or am I going to choose to serve my self-interest? And he takes the money. I did some research, and that weight of, most likely what we think, that weight in silver, 30 pieces of silver at that time, would, would equate weight in silver to about three or 400 bucks today. And so it's like, for three or $400, <laughs> Judas says, I'll take the money, and let's, let's do away with the Son of God. And the point that I want to make today is that I think we all do basically that same thing. I think every one of us does basically the same thing in some version or another because inside our hearts we're sinful. And this is a big deal to me because we're not just theoretically sinful. And oftentimes in church we love, 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 right? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we say it real loud and proud because we're super sinners. <laughs> but that's all theoretical, <laughs> Right? Like, we don't actually know. We, we couldn't put a name on how we're sinful. And so what I want to say today is I think we're all financially sinful. But here's what Jesus did, because Jesus is super awesome. He didn't say to Judas, well, you betrayed me for three or four hundred dollars. That's real terrible of you. I'm not going to go to the cross anymore. What Jesus did is he, he still went to the cross, because Jesus' mission on earth, right? Remember, he wasn't going to let money and stuff get in the way of completing his mission. And his mission on earth was to communicate God's love to humankind, sinful humankind, financially sinful human people, communicate his love by sacrificing his life for their good. In other words, the gospel says that Jesus loves you, right? Even though he completely knows <laughs> that you're a mess when it comes to money. And he still loves you. And here's what that means for today. <laughs> that means that all those crazy looks y'all were giving me at the beginning, which was like, you know, am I not allowed to have any money, Pastor Luke? You know, like, what are you, you know, do you need it? It's not about, the, the, the sermon is not, hey, God's only going to love you if you don't have a lot of money. Or even worse, if you pretend like you don't have a lot of money. Right? Similarly, <laughs> the sermon does not say, that only those of you who have followed Dave Ramsey's plan to a T and you're out of all debt and that you, you know, are giving, you know, 90% of your money to, like, God doesn't only love those people. The freedom is, this is the gospel story wrapped up into a sermon about money. The freedom is that God loves you precisely where you're at. And he has a really cool vision for what's the healthiest way for humans to spend money. 
and he knows you're going to mess that up, but he still loves you. And what that does is that completely changes how we get to spend money in this world. That completely changes the Christian view of money. Because all of a sudden, if we're completely loved, we don't have to use money to get people to like us. We don't have to use money to, as the saying goes, <laughs> buy things that I don't even need to impress people that I don't even like. Like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to be the utmost, you know, 100% most generous Christian in the history of the universe because God knows that you, that you aren't, right? But you get to move in that direction because that's the healthiest direction that God wants you to do. And so I hope, I hope that you get this point today, if nothing else. The God of the universe really loves you. And he loves you even though he knows that you're a sinner and that you're a sinner financially. And I hope that that gives you the freedom to like unearth, to open up your books, as I said earlier. Not because opening up your books, all of a sudden God's going to say, look how you messed up here and look how you messed up here and look how you messed up here. But because God wants you to live in the healthiest vision. Because what God knows is there's a lot of things, and we all know this too, there's a lot of things that are way more important than money. And because we get distracted, because it's too tempting to say that this stuff will make me happy, we get sidetracked to the real vision that God has for our lives. All right. Um, like I said, the beauty of living like Jesus is really, it, it, to me, it's becoming more and more beautiful over time. Um, my guess is you know what time it is because it's late, uh, as always for me. Sorry about that. And it's also uh, time that I share a couple of practical thoughts about how to actually make this a, a realistic in your life. And so please don't hear me say, do these things in order for God to love you. That's not exactly not what I'm saying today. What I'm saying is God loves you so much that he invites you to do these things for your good. So four things. Uh, number one, start with a budget. So every money thing always says the, the key thing is a budget. Well, why is that the case? It's precisely the case because the budget says, here's what I value in my heart. How do I make that actually work on the outside? It's exactly what Jesus is talking about. Whatever's on the inside comes out on the outside in, in a healthy way. And so a budget is your tool to make that actually happen. And so you start with a budget. And you don't have to be like the super duper expert budget person. Like month number one, I know exactly how this is all going to work. What you do is you start with a budget and then you refine it over time. It's real simple. Right? If you need help with that, talk to somebody here. Talk to me and I can get you hooked up with somebody. Number two is to minimize your stuff. Minimize your stuff. I think... This minimalist idea is beautiful because it basically is saying, I want to live based on what I care about the most. And so what I'm not saying is like, if you're an auto mechanic, you should minimize your tools so that you can be more like, clearly no, because you need some tools to be an auto mechanic, right? What I'm saying is take the extraneous stuff that's causing you distraction, causing you to lose focus in your mission from God and, and get rid of it. And my guess is you feel a lot more free, right? Like you walk into a non-cluttered space, you don't have all that extra junk around, it's like, Oh, I have more freedom here. <clears throat> Number three, to be radically generous. Be radically generous. You see, the Bible is really clear about its view of money. And what it says, it, it very clearly says that, that money itself is not evil. So I want to get that through our brains today. Like, if you have a bunch of money, God bless you. We love you. Like, you don't have to feel guilty about that for a second. God's view of money is that we can use money to be radically generous. And I'm not up here saying like, I need an airplane as a pastor of the church, you should give it here. I'm saying, be a generous, be a generous person because the story of the gospel is simply a story of God's generosity. It's that God loves you so much that he gave his son to die for you for your eternal benefit. And if we love are in, in, are in, are in a relationship with God like that, then why wouldn't we then also just become more generous, Right? So take some of that stuff you're trying to minimize, find somebody who needs some stuff, and give it to them, right? Uh, number four, experiment with small acts of self-denial. Experiment with small acts of self-denial. See, here's the issue, I think, is sort of like I mentioned last week. Practically speaking, we maybe know that stuff is not going to make us happy. But because every time the opportunity to get new stuff shows up, and then we get it right away, then we don't know if stuff makes us happy or not because we never have the opportunity to see if it doesn't. 
And so what I've found helpful, and maybe this is helpful for you, is sometimes if you're cruising Amazon, right, and you know that in two days you can get the new whatever it is that you want to get, right, and it can happen and it's easy and you have the money and you're not in debt and all that stuff, that's cool. What if you just say, let me not get that now, maybe I'll get it a month from now, and just see what that does. And, and here's my hope, here's my guess, and this is, this is why I'm sharing this today. I'm involved with all these funerals, I'm seeing people at the end of their, their lives, and it's, it's abundantly clear to me that there's a whole bunch of stuff that's way more meaningful and more important about life, like relationships with your family, that's a big deal. Like the fact that you have peace in your soul, that you're not doing some kind of like ugly financial situation in order to get a bunch of money. Like money can't buy that level of peace, right? And, and so the, the, the vision is that if there's things that are that meaningful, when we stop always getting what we always want to get, we might realize that that stuff kind of bubbles up to the surface, right? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, don't buy the thing because I actually have the friend, and the friend is what's really more beneficial than the thing, that kind of thing. So, um, all right, I'm over again. Sorry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. Um, I thank you mostly for the gospel, for the gospel that says that uh, we don't have to be perfect in order to be loved, but instead that uh, we are loved and then we can have the freedom to, to grow and to change into ways that are more and more like Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we would all just get a, a better vision, a clearer vision of the way Jesus lived his life and how beautiful and desirable that would be uh, and how we can do that not on our own effort, uh, but by your spirit placed in you because of Jesus' death on the cross. I pray, Lord, for everybody out here, for anybody who's a bazillion dollars in debt and has no idea what to do next and is feeling overwhelmed, um, that you would help them to realize that they are debt-free in your eyes because of Jesus. And I pray for those who have, you know, tons of financial resources, uh, that you would see that they didn't get them because they were perfect and that you only love them and don't love other people, but instead that that by your grace, uh, you have given those to people um, as a way to be able to show off your generous love to others. And I pray that we as a church uh, would not be, we'd be the kind of community of people that would care about things that are deeper than stuff, uh, even deeper than money. Um, I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.